Now I'm ready for our special guest, my co-host for the night, two-time Super Bowl champion of the Pittsburgh Steelers, my friend and yours. I am honored to welcome former offensive lineman for the Pittsburgh Steelers, Trey Essex. Trey, welcome to the show, my friend. How have you been? I've been great, man. Thanks for having me on. Oh, and you look fantastic right now. Thank you for fixing everything, man. Yeah. Um, we, we talked a little bit right before you came on the air mm -hmm. about this has to be a really special night for you because you went through the draft experience as well for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So mm -hmm. tell Steeler Nation what it's like and how draft night. I mean, back then, I think what we were doing, two days in the draft? <laughs> yeah, back then. Yeah, That was the marathon. That was when we sat down with like a case of beer and didn't get up off the couch for two days. But I exactly. think... <laughs> <laughs> um, but tell us how it was for you coming out of college. Draft night was amazing. And um, I was one of those guys where I had no idea where I was going to go, what range, what round I was going to go in. Everything was kind of up in the air. And so uh, growing up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, I was always a Steelers fan. Rob Woodson uh, was my hero. I used to go to his oh. camp growing up. And so <laughs> nice. I was already born in born and bred a Steelers fan. And so I had no idea the Steelers were as interested in me as they ended up being. Um, mm. But we ended up doing draft night at home or draft day at home. And I woke up bright and early that day. Cause like you said, back then uh, the first three rounds were on one yeah. day and then four yes. through seven were the next day. Right. And it was so, the weekend. It was like Saturday and then four through seven were Sunday. Exactly. And so yes. not knowing where I was going to be drafted, I got up, an hour before the first pick was even called and sat there in the same spot on my couch all day watching every pick get picked. Oh. Me. Some of these guys yeah. I trained with, some of the guys I said, I know I'm better than that guy. Right. And drafted in front of me. I mean, that happens all the time, you know. But um, the competitive spirit, uh, the competitive spirit in me was like, I'm better than that guy. He got drafted ahead of me. Hopefully I'm getting drafted soon. It gets to the end of the night and I don't get a phone call, don't get a text. I get nothing. And oh. I tell me and my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, I was like, yeah. I got to go. I got to get out of here. This is too oh. stressful. I'm probably going to have to wait till tomorrow anyway. Let's go bowling. Let me go throw a ball at some pins to take out some of this frustration. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I'm getting ready to walk out the door with some friends and my girl. And all of a sudden, this, this 412 number calls my cell phone. Like, yeah. I didn't know what area code that was at the time. I was like, <laughs> I was like, they're probably bill collecting or something. I don't know what's going on. So right. I answered a phone call. He was like, is this Trey Essex? And I was like, yes, this is Trey Essex. Hold, please. I'm like, okay. Say, like, Trey Essex, this is Bill Cower. How are you doing? I'm like, hey, coach. How are you doing? I'm hiding. My parents yeah. and all the friends were at the house was all excited. I was like, calm down. I can't hear. And so <laughs> Coach Carl was like, how are you doing today? What are you doing? Are you training? Like, how are you? How's your weight? I could hear his chin through the phone. I'll tell everybody. <laughs> and I was, he was like, are you ready to be a Steeler? I was like, hell yeah, coach. First time my parents ever heard me cuss, ever. Oh, <laughs> but they understood. Great. And so uh, from that day forth, I was a Steeler. Oh, what a great story. And, and that's got to be, did you meet with Bill or anybody? I, I think back then it was still uh, Kevin Colbert as the general manager. Right. Did you? talk with any of them during like your pro day or combine? So I didn't talk with the Steelers during the combine, they, but they brought me in for a visit. And that's, oh, when, I, that's when I met everybody. And so, yes. I mean, you can't, Russ Grimm was the O-line coach. Um, yeah. I couldn't really tell what Big their interest, interest lie, lie yeah. because Russ Grimm has the best poker face of all time. <laughs> <laughs> he, he got that poker face from being a hog on the, those old uh, Washington lines. <laughs> exactly. I thought maybe maybe he's not interested. In me. Maybe he didn't like the answers I gave because I couldn't tell one way or the other. He kept a stone yeah. face. But um, uh, he was the guy I learned later on that really uh, vouched for me and really liked uh, my film and the mm. individual drills at the Combine. So getting a chance to – not only get drafted, but know that he was my biggest advocate and he wanted me in his O-line room when they had the likes of Marvell Smith and Alan Fanica and Kendall Simmons and Max Starks and Jeff Hardings. He wanted me to be a part of that bunch. He yes. thought I, being a, I was extremely honored and, and always grace, grateful for that opportunity. And uh, I mean, 
Steelers O line, man. There's not a better lineage in the NFL of better players at a position group than the Steelers in their offensive line. And so it was great to be part of that. And I'll tell you what's so special about the evaluators and that offensive line is I think you are the only player out of all those other players that you mentioned that at least played part of every single position Yeah. for the Pittsburgh Steelers. You started at most of them. I think you started at four of the positions, but I, I think you even worked in at center the one game. Right, right. Uh, when we were two, when we were, when the backup was hurt, and I, I think you came in then after our starter went down that, that game. But yeah, versus it, the Rams, it, yeah. Yeah, and it's like every game you came in to start multiple games, we went to the Super Bowl that year. So it was like, you're the good luck charm on the line too. <laughs> I feel so, blessed. I like <laughs> so, so what's it like to have to be like, it's hard enough to concentrate and learn one position in the NFL, let alone be like ambidextrous and switch your body positioning going from like right tackle to left tackle or right guard to left guard. What is it about your game that made it that you could do those transitions like almost fluidly? It's almost like we only needed one backup. Uh, lineman every game because we knew you could play all the positions well the mental approach that I took to the game was probably what helped me out the most um I prided myself on knowing all the positions because I felt like if you knew all the positions whatever position you were playing if you knew what the guy next to you were, was doing or were trying to accomplish it helped you do your job better and so if I was to be able to start at one position if I knew what the left guard was doing I'm at left tackle or I know what he's trying to do then I know what I can do from the outset of the snap, I know what chances I can take, where he's going to be at it all the time. So I took that approach. And also when guys, when young guys would come in, I took it upon myself to be a mentor of sorts, to try to help everybody get on the same page as fast as possible, hear it from one voice. So they're not hearing it from multiple voices. So there's no confusion, no, 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 no uh, nothing lost in translation, so to speak. And so, um, and physically, I, I prided myself on being an athlete. You know, I was a basketball player that loved the game of basketball, but grew into a football player. I grew this way instead of this way. <laughs> right. And so um, because of that, uh, my footwork, I think, helped me uh, have a, a lengthy NFL career. And so it is tough. Switching from left to right when you've been playing left all through college is, is a tough transition. And people think just because tackle was attached to it that anybody can do it. No. <laughs> Left yeah. tackle and right tackles, as, as similar as the positions may look, they are usually built differently and yeah. have different assignments because they're going against different types of athletes across from them. And so yeah, because I my footwork, I had a good foundation, and um, I just prided myself on a mental approach to the game. I was able to succeed at multiple positions. And I equate this like playing right tackle and then playing left tackle. It's like – going out to play a professional baseball game as a right-handed pitcher and then showing up the next day and trying to go out as a left-handed pitcher. It, like, it, it's, it's like you understand the game, you know right. the mechanics of what you have to do, but then just to become opposite dominant, like to right. have your footwork be completely opposite of what you're doing, have your handwork being completely opposite as well. It, it's like, it is just such a testament to you and to Max Starks as well. Right. Like that guy, I mean, he won a Super Bowl at both tackle spots. Exactly. One is a left tackle, one is a right tackle. Exactly. I mean, and, and Zach Banner, I get to talk with him. He was a big friend of the show here a lot of times. He was mm -hmm. swing tackle and then got to explain to us how difficult that is. But what a testament. I mean, that's just really amazing. And then to do it at both guard spots, starting at right guard and left guard, getting in some center action. Yes. Uh, which position did you prefer to play the most? Which was your favorite? Uh, well, our left tackle probably was my favorite because I felt like it was the most physically challenging, and I like challenges. That was your college spot too, right? That was my college spot. Um, right. And I liked the athletic um, prowess that you have to play with to play that position. Yeah. And it was it was fun. Like, I'm going against the best pass rushers in the world. And – uh, I took pride in trying to stop them because, I mean, you can't stop them all all the time. They, they get paid a lot of money, too. But I like the challenge of left tackle. Um, but playing center was fun uh, because as everything starts with the center, nothing happens if the center doesn't snap the ball. Right. 
And a lot of bad things can happen if you have a bad snap. So there's a lot of exactly. pressure yeah. with that snap, but also you got to get everybody on the same page. And so with that, um, and you, physically speaking, it is the least physically demanding because you always get help. Yeah. But because you got to take the mental approach and you have to get everybody on the same page, got to point out to Mike, you get the quarterback on the same page, the wide receivers know their hot routes because of the point that you make. So really everything starts with center. So I had a lot of fun doing that. And I always consider center, I, I say this on every show or every year when we're talking about different, different positions on offense. Mm -hmm. Center is a skill position. Like yes. People say, people say, you know, your wide receivers, your tight ends, they, they, your writing backs, like those are the skill players. It's like, no, like, and Steelers know that. Like Steelers yeah. take their time to bring in great centers. I mean, they, they almost have – as many centers and starting centers in their history as they do head coaches. I mean, <laughs> right, it's, exactly. it, they do their diligence. So like, if you get to play any center on the Pittsburgh Steelers, that speaks a lot to like <laughs> you being able to pull off that position. I trust you. Yeah. If you can play that position. So, but you got to hold the ball. You got to, you got to snap. And as soon as you get that ball between your legs, you got to be up and blocking. Like that is yeah. just to me, like such a tough position to play, but yeah, I'm glad yeah. that you had a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> so a heavy 330 pound man breathing on you too. Right. Here. <laughs> <laughs> when you're trying to smoke that ball. So there is a lot of pressure, but I had a lot of fun playing. Right. And since you played every position on offensive line for the Pittsburgh Steelers, I imagine you are probably pretty up to date on the offensive linemen that are eligible in the draft this year. Most definitely. And there's no bias with this, whatever, but you know, my yeah. favorite one. That's what I want to know your favorites. <laughs> is this guy named Peter Skaronsky. He went to Northwestern. That's a great school, you know. Yep. I have no bias whatsoever, but uh, he's a. <laughs> just a little. <laughs> he just happened to be Northwestern Wildcats. That's all. But no, right, he, right, he, right. he's a, he, he's a great water. player. <laughs> he's a fantastic player. And actually, he has the skill set to play multiple positions, but he is a very. I think he's an all pro tackle if uh, whatever team decides to get him. Hopefully it's us, but right. he may be going away before we get a chance to pick. Regardless, I think he is uh, a tremendous tackle, but this is a very deep draft for tackles. I think we have a lot of great tackles in this draft with Roger Jones and um, Darnell Wright, mm -hmm. um, the kid yeah. out of uh, Paris Johnson. Um, yes. So all guys that I think are fantastic and will help a lot of teams. Now, Skronsky, do you see him as a primarily a right tackle, a left tackle, or do you think he could do both? I think he is a left tackle. If he's going to play tackle, what's on the left side? Okay. And, um, and I've, okay, go ahead. I know that people are concerned about his arm size or arm length or whatever, but I mean – Measurables are such an overrated tool. If you know how to play the positions and you're effective at it and you've done a great job, he's been all Big Ten two times in a row, all American. Outland, or he was the lineman of the year in the Big Ten, which the Big Ten is always lineman heavy. So in the same conference as uh, his draft mate, Paris Johnson, you know, and so he was the lineman of the year. And so um, measurables, I think, go out the window when you perform at the level that he performed. And I think that he would be a damn good left tackle for any team. I've also read on some breakdowns that say Skronsky might be better as a guard in yeah. the NFL. I um, think he would be good at any, any position, to be truthfully honest. Um, yeah. But people think, and they're saying that because of his arm size. They're, that's okay. strictly what they're basing it on. Um, which is arm length, I'm sorry, arm size, but <laughs> arm length, uh, because they feel like that the lineman will get into his chest faster because he doesn't have the ability to pin them off at a distance, a couple of inches, I guess. Uh, but no, he, he has played with those short arms or whatever for a long time. And I mean, we have a quarterback with little hands, and, but we have all the faith <laughs> in the <quarterback. laughs> like, well, <laughs> I, I like that you did mention that. Um, yeah. I, I know I just saw him on the pivot uh, a couple days ago right. when um, Ryan Clark brought that up too about his hand size and things like that. Now I've just decided that you and I both know when they measure hand size, they're mm -hmm. not measuring from the top of your hand to the base of your hand. They're measuring the distance between your pinky and your thumb. Correct. Right. Correct. So 
the problem is there if you don't have finger to thumb flexibility and your hand can only go like this as opposed to like this like i'm a musician like i can stretch flat right. on my finger so it makes it look like a nine. Yeah, yeah, exactly so <laughs> i've got a nine and a half whereas like my hand i know if i put it against your hand you've got a hand that dwarfs my hand uh-huh. so that to me it's like if I, if we start thinking about his you know like your hand the top of your ring finger to the bottom of your palm mm-hmm. I, I don't think you have anything to worry about hand size. And I think the same thing about Kenny Pickett. Now that I've seen him play for a year under us, right. that hand size didn't even come to an effect, even though we like to call him sometimes Kenny two gloves. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think Ben played with glove, at least one glove for a while, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And so, especially um, in the cold game. Exactly. And so it is what it is. It's this thing. We didn't have any fumble issues or whatever, or uh, he was able to whip that thing downfield off like, often enough i mean obviously his measurables didn't affect him for being the first round draft pick and a franchise quarterback for the best franchise in all the nfl and so if right tomlin, <laughs> <laughs> if coach tomlin and then at the time kevin colbert felt comfortable with him yeah. being our franchise and damn well all the steering nation should and, and you're getting a lot of love here miles Prescott is saying you're a legend travel buddy <laughs> Welcome to the show. So much love from Germany. He's our friend from Germany and yeah, Deutschland over there. Yeah, yeah, in Deutschland. <laughs> um, so you got to play and mm-hmm. win Super Bowls, right? With both Coach Cower and Coach Tomlin. I what's mean, it? What's the well, like? What's the difference between these coaches and what makes them both so great? Honestly, they're a lot similar than people think. Yeah. Um, they both let the players they my theory is they draft Steelers yeah. they draft guys that know can, can fit into the culture of the Steelers the culture that the Rooney set forth years ago a culture that the Steel Curtain and Terry Bradshaw and Lynn Swan and John Stell were set years ago the ones that Dermani Dawson set in the 80s the ones that Rod Wilson continued in the 90s they draft those guys and because of that yeah. they feel comfortable letting men be men there's not a whole bunch of micromanagement, you know, and they both abided by that. They both lived how they they would coach you up. They would yell at you. They would cuss you out. But at the same time, they don't let you do what you do. And players appreciate that. We are grown men at this point. Some of us have families. Even though there's a lot of young guys making a lot of money really fast, they let you figure out who you are without telling you who you need to be. And from a philosophical standpoint, that really drives to the root of the athlete. If I'm out here, they have enough faith in who I am as an athlete, yeah. how I can contribute this to, to this team, and they don't try to micromanage what I do off the field and on the field, mm-hmm. I'm going to give them everything that I can when I'm on the field. There's an expectation, and they let the players lead the group for the most part. And so because of that, they both had a lot of success. And that's why you got to give the Rooney family all the credit in the world because they know exactly what they're looking for when they're picking a the head coach. And um, with that, oh, we, we've got a question here, too, that I wanted to bring up here. Mm-hmm. Miles Pressgrave is asking you a question. Uh, Trey, what is your favorite Steelers moment? And how did it feel to be blocking for Big Ben? Oh, man. There's so many. You get, I mean, <laughs> the hell, you won two Super Bowls. How do you, yeah, like, how, how do you pick um, against both your kids, right? I mean, or you, yeah. you have, what, four kids, I think? Say so what? How many children do you have? Four? I got three. I got three. Three, three, three. Okay. I, I might give you four, but we'll see. We'll see. Ooh, <laughs> good luck, man. <laughs> awesome. But we got three. But um, my greatest moment as a Steeler, let me think about this for a second. Um, well, let me go to the blocking part. Blocking for Big Ben was stressful. <laughs> Don't get really? me. Really? I love him to death. But the great thing about blocking for Big Ben, when you go into that huddle, there's never a moment where you don't think you're going to win the game. Mm. Even when you're down big, wow. when he comes in that huddle and he looks at you, you know you got a guy that's going to win the game. Now, we had to block longer than most because he would scramble and he would make big plays, and that's fine. That was my job. I'm supposed to protect the quarterback at all costs. There's right. no time limit on when, how long I'm supposed to protect him. I'm supposed to protect him as long as he has the ball and then even longer after that. Mm. So I didn't have a problem with that. That was my job. Um, but I did it, and we did it, especially blocking for Big Ben, with a lot of confidence because we knew if we blocked for him, something good was going to happen. 
something great was going to happen. And he yeah, yeah. led us to three Super Bowls, two rings because of that mindset. And yep. you got to play on all three me. Super Bowl teams too. Yeah, I did. And yeah. I was I was blessed to block for somebody the caliber of the first ballot Hall of Famer that he's going to be in Ben yeah. Roethlisberger. Um, there's so many great moments to name in my Steelers career. Um, if I had to pick one, hmm, it would be playing the Chicago Bears in Heinz Field my rookie year. Starting at left tackle because Marvell was out. Yeah. We had 36 power called. Yeah. And number 36 was running the ball. Oh, and now, now I know that 36 didn't mean the number. It's it's the which hole you're going to go and which yeah. which uh, position gets the ball. It's just <laughs> coincidence that it just matched up with one with of the best number. of all time, too. And so uh, my job is relatively easy on the backside of that play. I just got to make sure that my inside gap is clear and make sure nobody catches the running back from behind. OK. And so and Alan Fanica, who's at the left guard at the time, Hall of Famer, one of my greatest mentors and one of the best, greatest human beings I've ever known is pulling in that hole for, for uh, Jerome Bettis. And it's snowing. It is Pittsburgh weather. Um, and we need this game. This is when we go on that run to win. We're 75 and we had to win five games in a row. To make it to the oh, play. you're talking about the Chicago game. If yeah. you're talking about the, the snow, the oh, Chicago in 05, game. I remember that. That the, was a momentum shifting game, right? Uh, for the Steelers on the road, playing a great Chicago team at the no, time. We, Ryan we Urlacher, were, we were yeah. at home, we were at home. Oh, that was a home game. Okay, that cool. That's right. why everything was perfect. It was snowing, not snowing too hard, but snowing hard enough. Yeah, so when you saw when you saw the pictures, you saw the snowfall. Yes, so it was just, like all the steel shots were amazing. But <sighs> this is the game. Where Alan Penica pulls around, I think he he blocks Lance Briggs, and it's only Ryan Erlacher and Jerome Bettis in the hole. Jeez. And we all know yep. what happens. Yeah, he <laughs> bull, he he plowed and trucked. He plowed Hall of Famer Brian Erlacher in the hole about five. He I think he hit him about five yards short of the of the touchdown. Yeah. And well, he couldn't do nothing but just hold on. Rode the bus into the end zone. <laughs> rode the bus into the end zone. <laughs> And so as a rookie, uh, who which yeah. all I'm doing is just trying not to F it up. I'm not trying. <laughs> right. like, I need to do my job, and I'm not worried about anything else. But on this particular play, all I got to do is step a hinge, mm-hmm. and then my job is done. I actually have a chance to see the end of that play. And just uh, watching it, it, it unfolded uh, in slow motion for me. <laughs> as Jerome Bettis plowed Brian Erlacher into the end zone and kind of just set the tone for the rest of the season after that. It was a Ex- beautiful thing. Exactly. And it's like these big moments that kind of set like the, the, the tackle that Ben made after the Bettis fumble in, in that um, yeah. in that Indianapolis game. Like yeah. that was such a big moment. Right. Uh, is what, what you, nobody expected. And Be- Bettis would tell you that his itself is like he no one expected Bettis to fumble in that no. situation. It was and, a, Gary Brackett because I lived in Indy for a while. Gary yeah. Brackett was the guy that made the tackle. And uh, or the guy was, that made the, the, the fumble. Or he was the guy that made the tackle on Jerome Bettis, the one that oh, called yeah, the oh, fumble. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And so he was like, "Dude, I was scared." <laughs> it's like I was in the hole with Jerome Bettis. I just happened to get my helmet in the right spot, and he did. Kudos to him. And we had our goal line team in. People don't understand when you have the goal line team, you got all the biggest guys on the team. Right. And the only guy, and the guy that picked up the fumble was a defensive back. We had yes. no business making that tackle. It, that, was that Harper, I think? Yes, Harper. And he got uh, – crazy enough, that week he got stabbed in his leg. By like, his that, I, I, that's a, like, it's, it's just such a crazy, like, burned, ingrained moment. Yeah. It, what, by, I think, his girlfriend at the time or exactly. significant yep. other. So, like, that helped slow him down, I think, because yeah. you know his stitches weren't healed. I mean, he played the whole game at that point. So, <laughs> you, well, he's going to play no matter what. Yeah, but... that was the fourth quarter. But I mean, <sighs> he went in instead of going out. And Ben, being the athlete, he is made an amazing tackle. But yeah, that season was made of just signature plays by the offense and by the defense that propelled us to the Super Bowl. Like I said to my man who asked the question, so many great memories, but those definitely stick out and kind of set the tone for the rest of my series career. I was spoiled. I thought I was supposed to go to the Super Bowl every other day. <laughs> it seemed like it. Like they, 
this those Steeler teams right there between 05 and like even continuing up to 11 and 12. Mm-hmm. We just thought we had a shot every year because that's the way that these teams were built. You guys had that mindset, everybody, uh, you know, playing hard too. And, and I need to ask you a quick question too. Um, Was it harder to play and block the people on game day or was it harder to block the Steelers defense in practice when you're going up against guys like Harrison, Porter, uh, Haggins, uh, Woodley? Yeah. I mean, you had some phenomenal pass, pass rushers on the edge uh, and even some good people like Timmons coming up the middle as well. Like, yeah. what was it like? <laughs> I mean, wh- obviously, like, which one was harder? And then describe what it's like to go against that harder so, position. You make me take my hat off to think about this because <laughs> practice was stressful because we had to go back and watch film yeah. of us blocking one-on-ones versus our guys who, who was the best – defense in the world so when i was playing multiple positions i had to go one-on-one pass rush is a drill that we have where we go one-on-one versus somebody on the defensive side of the ball that that's lined up across from us and so i would go left tackle versus james harrison i usually lost because he (laughs) was the strongest human on earth yeah i would go inside a wolverine silverback aptly named silverback my gosh yeah left guard i would go against aaron smith or or brett keasley oh my goodness go to center i gotta block casey hampton what the (laughs) hell (laughs) or nick easton or chris hokey like these are guys that just and then right tackle kimo bono lawfin and (sighs) then go to right right uh tackle I got to block Clark Higgins or Joey Porter or Lamar Whitley. I mean, it was stressful to go to practice and block those guys. So, yes, it was a relief when we got to game day because I'm like, man. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you're playing against the best blockers you're going to see all season right. in practice. So. Exactly. And they didn't cut no slack. Like, no. They would go hard at you. Right. And then if they beat you, they were like, good job, work on this, work on that. And that was a great thing. They would give you feedback. It was There weren't a lot of egos on our team. Yeah. And even the greats would come back and tell you, you know, this is what I did to you. This is what I saw that you do that gave me advantage. So if you fix this, you'll be better off for it. And so when we got that type of advice for some of the greatest players in the world, yeah, we were good on game day. 